Alex, thank Chris. you very much. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Uh, welcome to the offices. Um, why don't we start by you telling me about, a bit about yourself and what Landmark does. Fantastic. So uh, I'm Alex Rotsley. I'm the Managing Director for Landmark Information Group uh, Geodata Division. Um, it's the part of the business that sells geospatial data to the land and property sector. Um, my background, I started off as an entrepreneur working in media technology, uh, spent some time uh, running the Innovation Centre for Ordnance Survey and Land Registry, Geovation, where I worked with around 150 um, prop tech startups to get them launched and grow, including some quite, quite well known ones. And so in the last four years, been at Landmark helping build our geospatial data business. So you essentially provide enormous amounts of data to the sector as a whole. Yeah. And so you're very well positioned to see what the trends are in the markets, mm -hmm. how people are using the data. What have you noticed so far? That's a big question. Uh, uh, so you're right. So Landmark has been, it's our 30th, 30th anniversary in April. Yes. Um, so we're almost at the original PropTech yeah. company. Yeah. And at the heart of it, you say, we have a lot of data. We, and this idea of authoritative data is really important to the sector. Um, whether it's in uh, due diligence or feasibility or transactions, you need to know the information is right. So I think what we've always seen is that high quality data with provenance and indemnity behind it is really fundamental to almost every aspect of the land and property sector. And we've uh, we've made that our, our raison d'etre, right? That's our key driver, our value proposition for yeah. our customers is, if you come to Landmark, you're, you're buying products that are based on the best available data with that degree of provenance and indemnity behind it. So what do we see? I think in the last, since I've been in the business the last few years, there's clearly an acceleration between how people access and consume that data. When I joined, and for many of these 30 years of Landmark, the data's been packaged up as reports or as it's almost artifacts. Yeah. Is that what is? yeah. yeah physical products, things people can take away with them, whether that is a valuation report or a um, legal search or a printed map for use in a, in a sales particular pack. So that we were very much input into those, those, those things, those things that were taken out and, and worked with. Obviously, now we're deep in kind of the digitization and, and, and digital transformation era. People want to say, well, actually, rather than take the data, stick it into a PDF, take it out of a PDF and store it by server, why don't I just get access to the data at source from you? And that's the journey we're on of moving from, I say, a pool model where someone jumps onto a service, marks up what they want, yeah. gets a certain asset of it, to a push where they say, I'm doing something in my business and the data automatically is available to me in the things I want to do. But it's still raw data. So the language I like to use is package data. Yeah. Uh, so my view and Landmark's view is that we don't sell raw data. Yeah. Um, very simply, we think the raw data is commoditized. Effectively, raw data is anyone can get it. And if it's open data, literally anyone can go yeah. and download it from a government website. What's important though, is how you bring different data sets together, make sure they're congruent, make sure they are aligned correctly. And then what we do is we QA them. Yeah. We know when they're last updated, we check when they're last updated. We can then put that indemnity behind it for professional users, which says, you can get the data for yourself yeah. from there, but you've got no indemnity. If you get it from us, we'll give you, you know, our, our indemnity start at 60,000 pounds for the basic, but up to 10 million pounds of PI yeah. and some of the stuff we do. So that's kind of a key part of how we package that up. And that's sort of the first part of the layer cake and then we take our package data and then we do turn it into services that can be consumed, whether those are risk evaluation services. I mentioned earlier when we were chatting yeah. before this conversation about Risk yeah. Pro, yeah. whether it's um, for material information packs, for valuations and, and estate agents, or whether it's the data that goes into a legal report. Yeah. But yeah. And you provide unique insights? We do through some of our businesses. So yeah. we have uh, a business called Argyle Environmental, which looks yeah. at um, providing consultancy services. And we do uh, consulting-led conversations of work with customers who have specific requirements. So they'll come to us, and, and we do that particularly in the land in the land space. Someone yeah. might come to us and say, uh, "We have an example recently where someone was putting in place a uh, a, a contract to manage a, a high-pressure fuel pipeline." Okay. And they need to know what was happening near that fuel pipeline site within 50 meters, yeah, yeah. particularly around new planning applications. But they also want to know what about the geography might change, there's new flood risk and stuff yeah. like that. 
So we would put together a bespoke report and then a bespoke service that updates that report for them okay. digitally. So they get every, I think for them we do a monthly update cycle, they get a digital output every month that they can then consume <coughs> in their systems and their GIS systems, yeah. um, geographic information systems. And do you use any AI today? Um, we do in some parts of the business. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there, we're still at the early part of exploring, again, AI so is this. a broad yeah. place. So we've been using machine learning yeah. um, for many years. So we have one of the largest repositories of historical maps, okay. and we've been doing feature extraction and feature recognition within them for more than 15 years, where we would pick out um, historical land use. Yeah. So when it was an orchard, when it was a field, when it was a reservoir. And we've digitized that using sort of fairly well-known um, computer vision techniques to try and understand that. Yeah. So I think we're quite good on the geospatial side. I think what's shifting now is what do these much newer tools, what do the Gen AI stuff, where does that sit? And I think it's fair to say that we're probably using it like many, many others are at the moment, which yeah. is um, we're building tools around lease, lease information, lease yeah. analysis, which is, yeah. which is really interesting. But I think what's important is actually less so much what you do with that, but where you take the information next. Uh, when I was looking at the notes before this conversation earlier on, the benefits of Gen AI are great, but they're also fairly, it's like the rising boat thing, right? Yeah. Because everyone can access them. Yeah. They're so good and they're so powerful. They're not really a differentiator, or very quickly they won't be a differentiator. Yeah. Um, the fact that, you know... Just Jack, like Excel isn't. Exactly. Well. It's just a capability. It's always working. So I think, you know, um, what we're doing, trying to work out right now is how do we use that in the right context, particularly for things like legal interpretation. And this is where it's really interesting and live conversation between if you're giving someone information for a legal transaction, you want it to yeah. be absolutely right. Yeah. And the problem with AI, we know, it isn't always right. Yeah. But there was a counter position put recently by someone, I think, in the Law Society, who said, actually, you should almost say that you, if you're not using AI, you're not doing the right thing for your customers because it's so good and so efficient. So we're at this really interesting inflection point, but what do we expect in terms of the risk management around these tools? Yeah. And as we're the largest provider of searches in the property sector, so we have to think very carefully about how and when we exercise these these technologies yeah. but it's going to be probably a big part of what we do clearly yes yeah, so, but so looking outside of the landmark you provide all of this package data mm -hmm. to just about everyone in the industry surely their use of it has changed over time mm -hmm. from simply informing the decisions to now driving decision making to improving operations to driving where they're building what they're building how much they're pricing it at mm -hmm. And so on, where do you see the biggest trends within that? In, in, sort of in your conversations with yeah. clients, where I think, where again, going? it's very uh, lumpy, right? Yeah. It's very unevenly spread adoption. Uh, I think we discussed previously the fact that the levels of sophistication in terms of data adoption in this sector are extremely uneven. You've got some people who are operating at a really high level of sophistication, but lots of organizations are still barely moving beyond yeah spreadsheets for understanding what yeah. they're doing and some are still doing paper-based you know analysis yeah. and stuff so i think at one end we do see people want to use data because this is an encouraging thing right people yeah. want to use data they want to do more with it they want to kind of have those insights they know there's power and value in doing stuff with it so we're having the conversations people are getting in touch and saying what data do you have i think the best things we're seeing i think in terms of you know um understanding things like the planning stuff, you know, yeah. what, what's going on, you know, having better intelligence. I think probably have the information and intelligence about a site, whether it's the site information, the information around it, historical data around it. I think people are aware that's all available to them now, yeah. whether they want to get it from a, a, a SaaS solution, there's companies out there that do that, we, we know those guys, um, whether they want to ask for it on a consulting basis from us or whether they want to get it themselves and build their yeah. own models, yeah. they know that there's a lot of a lot of information around sites that they can access in, in that kind yeah. of development space. Um, and we've seen that in the data, we did some research recently and that came up very highly. The, the most thing, I want more information so I can understand what sites are available and what I can do with those sites. Yeah. And I think that's probably the biggest area of adoption and government is leaning hard okay. into that to make more available. Yeah. Um, I took part in a consultation session recently with the Department for um, Leveling Up Housing Communities 
and they are exploring with the land registry how they can expose uh, charges and covenants and options. They call it uh, consultation on contractual obligations yeah. on land. Yeah. That's pretty disruptive, right? Because that yeah. information is currently quite quite hard to get a hold of. Yeah. Frankly, I'm not sure the house builders are going to particularly want to those options to become openly available. But it gives an example of how once data is in the system, there comes this increasing pressure to kind of make it available and open it up. And I think and that's something that our clients absolutely know they need to be at the forefront yeah. of because if they're not thinking about that stuff, their competitors are. Yeah. So I think um, in terms of sort of where we see it going next or whether we've seen the next round of kind of benefits, I think some of the stuff we've been talking to you about in terms of feasibility and yeah. in terms of being more sophisticated in how they evaluate the commercial opportunities around yeah. property, uh, how they evaluate that, that's going to be really interesting. Uh, I think in terms of consultation, we talked again about how people engage with communities. I think that's going to be an important area. And at the forefront of technology, stuff we've been doing with biodiversity net gain and using yeah. satellite data to understand ecology and habitat and habitat change over time uh, is, a, is the first of what I think a wave of applications that take satellite and aerial data and start to drive really interesting new insights uh, based on land use. And that's yeah. pretty, pretty cool. But it sounds like a lot of businesses are being dragged into the age of AI through regulation, slightly reluctantly. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because at Artifact, we have a whole series of sectors where we develop data and AI. Mm -hmm. And property is firmly the least mature mm -hmm. sector of all of our sectors. Uh, retail, consumer goods, fintech leading the way massive applications of it. We see execs are spending significant amounts of money and the planning budgets around changing ways of working, AI, better use of data, mm. and so on. And now that there's so much data available, what's stopping execs from property companies Good really thing. embracing PropTech and really making something out of it? I think there's two things. I think the first thing is that the data in property is not big data. Yeah. I think people have, I think in FMCG, when we talk about low mobile phone networks. Low volume of transactions. Low, relatively. I mean, the yeah. thing we talk about, and I remember I used to work ordinance survey, and people say, is, is OS a big data company? And OS uh, has a database of you know, half a billion features, updates like 10,000 features a day. And, you know, we were talking to a technology company, like, well, that's not, that's not big. That's not big data. That's tiny. And yes, it's interesting because it's complex. And where the, where the complexity in geospatial comes from is when you've got half a billion points moving in different directions and changing together, that becomes complex quickly. Yeah. But the fundamental data that sits behind the property system isn't big data. Yeah. So the, the, the models that mine, you know, every mobile phone call and transaction, every bank, you know, yeah. every every time you spend 20p or 50p on your yeah. contactless, that sort of information is ripe for kind of really fast. And small changes and shifts yeah. have huge impacts. And it's commoditized. And it's commoditized. Because no property is unique. Oh, sorry, no property is the same. Every property is unique. Um, so that's what, holds, that's what holds it back, I think. Yeah. And again, the second thing I was going to say is that, that the property industry is still very human-led, whether it is agents selling property, whether it's you know, commercial lawyers building relationships with um, portfolio owners, whether it's um, technology advisors, but it's very, it's still quite hands-on and personal. And I think there's probably some fear yeah. that automation starts to drive out the value of those human interactions. That is yeah. probably unfounded, but I can see why the people are a bit nervous about bringing the tools and technology to do things that they consider to be their right. expert domain, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because in my last few years of, sort of selling AI and data to property executives, I found while contextual and market data has improved dramatically, primarily through work of Landmark, their own data hasn't. Hmm. And so they always were saying, my data is just not there. They are still very much saying data paints part of the picture, hmm. but not the whole picture. Yeah. Property is irrational. You need experience. You need a gut feeling. Hmm. You need to be able to walk the block and understand the fundamentals of, of an area, which yeah. AI will never be able to do. Um, but then there also are very few 
data disruptors or prop tech companies that are coming through and are saying, actually, let us automate the whole back office mm -hmm. aspect. Let's keep the, the human interaction where it's actually important, yeah. but let's automate the rest. And I find there's very few companies coming through that are actually focused on that. And I find so many low hanging fruits in that sector. Now, it's interesting that no one yet has really come in and made changes in a big way. And few, a few have tried. I'm thinking of Purple Bricks has tried to change mm. the way of uh, the agents yeah. with very little success. Uh, but there's no big changes happening in the market. It's very slow moving. So we've got a project that's going on. I talk about it because we've launched it recently called Landmark Connect. Yeah. And I think we one of the ways we're approaching this problem. So Landmark systems touch in one way, but probably 90% of the transactions that go through touch one of our systems. I mean, we're involved in the valuation process for banks. Yeah. We have estate agency services through Landmark Agent. We, um, we help people arrange um, for surveys and, and convincing, and we do a lot of search businesses. So we, we touch lots of parts of the transaction. Yeah. And as such, we're really in this live conversation of how do we reduce transaction times and help that digitized process. As you rightly point out, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, yeah. but it's so dispersed. So our approach has been um, to look at how can we standardize components within this and make them interoperable. Yeah. So it's kind of an extensible system. So rather than it being one massive thing everyone has to buy into and everyone has to agree with, we say, no, no, look, We'll just set up rules of engagement for how conveyances exchange data, for how yeah. agents exchange data, how lenders exchange data. And we'll start to create some easy interconnects for those things to be handed across. So, you know, what does a you know, valuation look like and how does it get passed across? And we already do that through our secure panel network for, yeah. for lenders. So our approach is give people the tools to get bits of the process working and then and then you can build from there because it's not going to be a flash in the pan, right? But, yeah. but, but if you can give people that starting point to onboard with that, the benefits of having well-organized data, the, sta the, the standards compliant, that interacts with other people, then you start to see the benefits of, oh, I could do more of that in my yeah. business. I think that the danger is you then have these big property companies that have little silos mm. where they can use machine learning or AI to aid decision-making, but it doesn't fundamentally change their corporate position the yeah. way they work as an organization, or the type of buildings they build, or how they think about leasing and all sorts of things. Mm. And a big part of me was hoping COVID would be a catalyst for that change. Mm. And two years on, three years on, I don't see that change actually happening. And I think we're going back to business as usual in many respects. Isn't that the challenge though? This is why startups exist, right? Because yeah. changing from a position of being an incumbent and a fundamental business model shift, let's yeah. say in the property owner, uh, an office leasing company will be. That's really hard. It's really hard for people to change everything they do you on the fly. Set up a, a, a new. Well, I think as we often do, they'll set up a, yes. a spin off to do these yeah. things because actually it's easier to start from a fresh. And I was talking to someone. We've had all the legacy systems. And well, it's interesting stuff. I was talking to a colleague recently about the tyranny of financial planning, right? Yeah. And how uh, my colleague just finished his MBA a couple of years ago. They talked about all the different ways you can do financial planning. And in fact, that 90% of the way organizations do it is not very good. Yeah. Like three year forecasts, five year forecasts, you know, qu quarterly. Yeah. yeah. But that's what the financing systems require. Yeah. That's what if in a public company, that's what the markets require. So there's this kind of external dynamics about how you do it. All the evidence says moving to shorter forecast cycles with more leading indicators, more evidence driven changes, pivoting quickly or strategy based on market insight, far more effective. It's much harder. It's much harder. It's much harder. It's not easy. Yeah. And it requires people who've got those skills and the incentives to change to do that. And guess what? In live businesses, that's that incentive isn't really necessarily there for the people doing the work. So I think there's something about how you affect change and transformation in organizations. Um, is a fascinating area. For me, it's an area I'm, I'm always interested in. How do you move organizations forward and what, and what things can you do? And I think this data story is at the heart of it in the property sector, which is how do you make them want to go on that journey? It requires often disrupting themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I think... It requires a change agents. I think start with small changes and yeah. start small. I think often... Build confidence. Start small, build confidence. I mean, I know, I would say it's because it's my background in, in innovation, but 
I think people often, I think one of the questions your colleague asked me earlier on was, um, how do you recommend someone get involved with AI? Yeah. I always say, just start playing with it. I'm not an expert in AI. I'm not going to become an expert in, you know, in, you know, latent space and large language models anytime soon. But I can be they curious. Would. Yeah. And I can read about it and I can learn about it and I can test stuff. So yeah. I've signed up for these services and I'm playing with them and trying out what I can do. A tiny, tiny surface yeah. level. But I think encouraging organizations to just have a go. Yeah. You know, if you've got a bit of budget, spend a bit of money with a startup yeah. or with a small company or with yeah. someone like us and just say, look, can we do an experiment and see what this does? Yeah. And then you can learn from it. But I think that is often again counter to the, I want a big bang. Yeah. So. I'm working with a client at the moment who's a large London REITs, and they've done something interesting. So they've pulled together an AI working group, which is made up of some top execs, some middle ranks, and some people at the core face mm -hmm. within their buildings and so on. And they meet on a monthly basis and they chat about the advances in AI, how they can possibly be applied to their business, mm -hmm. what they can do with it, uh, what changes they're seeing in the market, those sorts of things. And I think it's great to start the conversation to start getting everyone thinking. Mm. And I think what they've done, which is quite smart, is it's not just a group of execs that get together and talk about AI. They've actually gone through the entire organization, yeah. found people who are at the front face, saying, what do you struggle with? Where are your challenges? Yeah. Where can AI help? And I was chatting to one of the members of that group uh, last week, and she said, what's fascinating is we don't understand the challenges they have. And often, a lot of people lower down the chain, already using AI to make their lives better. They're yeah. just not telling us about it yeah. because they're not sure if it's allowed to, et cetera, et cetera. But they're already using it. Yeah. And typically they're younger, they're more curious, they're growing up with the technology. And I think gradually as the older execs get pushed out, get replaced by newer people, there's going to be some change mm -hmm. coming through. But I think there's still fundamental issues in the sector with data, data itself. And I think there's massive gaps. Mm -hmm leases are not recorded. Yeah. So we rely on things like CoStar and other providers, Realize, etc., to give us a snapshot of the market. These are useful for trends. They're rarely useful in the building per building. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around regulation. Uh, the new leasehold format, all those sorts of things are changing how companies behave. Mm. And so I think there's a bit of paralysis of sitting on our hands. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's yeah. see what's going to change and so on. And then the last thing I was going to change is that I was going to say is that the the pace of change in AI is so fast that I speak to execs who say, if I wait another six months, it will get cheaper, it will get better. I'll just wait because actually I have recurring rents coming in. Yeah. I'm not too worried about uh, getting out of business in the next six months. I have lots of predictability in my revenue. Therefore, I'm, I, can, I can afford to wait. Yeah. I think that's leading to a lot of paralysis. It's a really good, so there was a great article um, I'll, I'll share with you later on, literally about this, it was called The Tyranny of the Weight Calculation. Okay. And it's exactly this challenge, which is an example they gave, was imagine a scenario in which you were um, heading off on a mission to Mars. Yeah. With today's, today's technology, you could be there in 50 years. Or yeah. well, the next next step with Barnard Star, 50 years. Yeah. You know, so you get your rocket together, you get your people together, you jump. Five years later, a new technology is developed that means you can get there in two years. So your first group is on its 50 year journey to Barnard Star. And meanwhile, the next group is flying past them. They're yeah. there five years later and they go and they arrive there yeah. you know, 10, 40 years earlier. And that's kind of the challenge with any new technology, which is it's, a, it's, a, it's true. It's moving yeah. so quickly. But then the argument of, oh, I'll just wait and see is also a really poor one. Oh, because really? You want to be ready to move on the next generational shift first. Yeah. You, you don't, don't want to learn. So in, learn. in the example of the Mars, if you don't launch the first rocket, you won't have the lessons learned to develop the technology yeah. into the next bit. Exactly. But maybe you only send, you know, a small pilot group of five people on that rather than your yeah. whole colony ship, you know. And that's the thing you've got to try and get right, which is how do you you need to be live and working on this stuff. You need to be your eyes and your organizational senses need to be involved in these things because they are transformative technologies. We still don't know quite where they're going to land. And we are probably at the peak of the hype at the moment, right? And yeah. I think there was a great example. It's still fundamentally you know, AI tools. They're very expensive for yeah. chat for open AI and you know, to run, right? Yeah. 
the economics have not yet shaken yeah. down. But we know there's interesting stuff going on. There'll probably be a, a fall off, I imagine, in the next few months of where we'll go, but oh, it's maybe not not the massive saviour. Maybe NVIDIA isn't a two trillion dollar company. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean these aren't really transformative technologies. Yeah. And you need to make be your teams need to be, as you say, curious, playing with my favorite example you gave of a of a organization working through the organization yeah. just to be aware of it yeah. is is the right way to be involved. But spend discrete amounts of money understanding what you can do. And I think someone said before, you know, you've got this idea of innovation. You can either have grand changes which require, you know, a hundred million dollar investment and require board approval. And then you've got this kind of the incremental stuff, which I think Siemens used to call was like just what you've got to do every day. Yeah. Can I make my process a bit better? Can I improve something a bit every day? And, then, and in the middle is this kind of idea you want to get obviously to focus on really good functional right-sized innovation, which is it's not about the farm stuff, but it's well scoped. It probably has a bit of resource around it, maybe 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand. Yeah. But it has a specific goal, a measurable outcome. A very clear exam question. And and you learn from that yeah. process. And I think that's the area we need to get people focusing on is not transforming their whole organization today with technology, but spending enough money to understand where those transformations will come from. Yeah. And I think that's an area where the combination of sort of the right expertise around AI, the right yeah. data, because fundamentally is where we come into it is that these models only work effectively if you've got the right provenance behind them. If you don't know, if you're starting from poor source data, you can't make the right interpretations. Um, and I think that gives you the ability to then start to say, okay, we know, I guess it's knowing where the target is, right? What, what's that line? Where are you forecasting? Yeah. Where do you think it's going to land in six yeah. months, 12 months? Yeah. And of course, it's all within a code of uncertainty. But the more conversations you have right now, the closer you know where you're going to be able to land in a couple of yeah. years' time. No, absolutely. And, you know, fundamentally, people will win and lose based on their application of these technologies. Yeah. And I know Landmark surveys a lot of property execs, mm -hmm. and you survey them on sentiment and so on. Are boardrooms starting to get scared? Uh, scared? Well, in terms of... of... Of what AI can do and new disruptors coming in with, where essentially very low capital would, would get you quite far and they're being burdened with legacy systems and legacy thinking. I wouldn't say as scared as they probably should be. Yeah. I think, yeah, as, as you probably were, I mean, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say complacency, but there is a lot of inertia. I think it's gonna take someone doing something really smart that illustrates that. It might be on a relatively small financial scale. It might be a, um, but people will start to use these technologies and start to get some, I think the first time someone does a really good arbitrage on a transaction using these technologies, yeah. Um, and spots. I mean, we've talked before about using this technology to do things like, um, yeah, portfolio evaluation uh, for you know, mortgage-backed securities. Or, or that. Those are the areas where I think someone's going to make a 10 million, 50 million, 100 million pound, you know, bet and win. And that's when people are going to go, hang on a second. I don't see those bets taking place though. Well, I see them happening in other countries. I don't see them happening here. Well, that's why I think that's the opportunity is going to sit. Yeah. I, think. I, I see lots of these bets in the US. I see lots of them in Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan. I don't see them really here. I think, I think because people are nervous about, you know, trusting the data. And I yeah. think ultimately, you know, I mean, the US and Singapore are good examples. They're highly entrepreneurial cultures. Appetite for risk is very different. But do you think the US has better data? No, no. We've, got, we've got better data, fr frankly. Yeah, I think. And, and yeah, but we haven't got that appetite for risk because I think people are too, I think it's partly I mean, for different reasons. Singapore, because of its nature, you know, has different economy. But America is a big market, right? Yeah. There's enough room for people to win yeah. and lose. And people do take, they swing for the hills more often. It's that simple. Yeah. The, the market, there's no, there's much more forgiveness for failure yeah. because people know that you know, same, whether it's venture capital market or the investment market, people are happy to know someone's going to take 10 bets and one might pay off. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, I mean, I said a lot of work with startups in this country, raising money in Europe is a completely different game because yeah. people expect, you know, they want everyone to win. It's like, but the reality is that's not how this game works. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of making big bets with data, I think culturally we're still trying to get comfortable with that. Yeah. And I think, so the irony is, 
we almost certainly have better data for lots of this yeah. stuff than other cultures do. I mean, the UK is an amazing market for digital, full stop. I mean, after the US, we're the second largest digital, yeah. think technology digital marketplace. And hugely, you know, online culture and, and in terms of e-commerce and stuff, we're really very switched on as a nation to this stuff. Um, and we have tons of data around these property sectors. But yeah, I mean, I'm always amazed when I go and see property companies that they tell us, oh, our data is very poor. Hmm. And actually, the truth I find is that executive access to good, reliable data is very poor. They actually have lots of data. A lot of it is siloed into spreadsheets or systems that don't talk to each other. Mm. And they actually have far more data than they need. They just don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And often, where we add the most value is not the super shiny AI stuff. It's saying, well, do you know if you combine this with this, this data set with this data set, you can create this insight that suddenly saves you three million pounds. Yeah. Uh, and that's where CFOs and execs get particularly excited. Yeah because they see the pound figure. Well, that's, that's the low hanging fruit. I mean, as you say, there's, and this is what I like about, you know, your business model of that being you know, an operational consultant as well as an AI specialist, I think it's really good because it is all about the implementation. It's all about how you get people to look at their systems. And you're right, I mean, people, I mean, it's extraordinary. The, the, the issue of knowledge sharing with organizations is one of the things you think by now would be a solved problem. I have not found an organization yet that does knowledge sharing yeah. brilliantly. Yeah. It's really hard to get people to spend enough time to document, to make it available for them, people to know where to find yeah. that information. Um, and again, maybe AI is going to help us. I mean, some of these tools, yeah. being allowed to use these tools within your own corporate domain makes it easier to surface stuff. Um, the co-pilot plans, yeah. are, uh, that's part of, you know, show me last quarter's you know numbers and, and yeah. do stuff with it. But it's still very early days. I, I was speaking to the exec yesterday about that, who said that banned Copilot completely because they're afraid of where we'll do to their data. Yeah. And that will it leak, will it go out? Where do you see the future of AI? And mm. what advice will you have to a property exec as to how to adopt it? Just a small question. Just a small question. Um, I've, I've, personally, for me, I find a lot of it is I want to get involved when I speak to them. I don't know how. Mm. It's, it's such. AI is such a big word, it's a bit scary. I don't really know how to start my company on the journey of adopting AI. I think it would start with understand what data you have available, both from the marketplace and external data that you need and from your own internal systems. Before you start thinking about the tool, you yeah. know, think about the problem. Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish? Because AI might be the solution or part of the solution but it might be the end state rather than the starting point of that. So I think often people jump straight to the new and shiny tool. So I think, get your data in good condition, think about the problems you want to solve, where are the challenges in your business, then engage with experts to help you say, how can I solve those problems? And that will probably be a combination of getting systems that interact yeah, the data effectively, yeah. let you start to analyze it in new and interesting ways, and then put it in a place where you can start to leverage new technologies, AI and other things, in the most appropriate way. I think jumping straight to the end of the last chapter in the book is the, is the problem. People yeah. hear AI will save my own business and it's not that simple, it never is. But if you go through it logically, if you engage with it, absolutely there are huge savings and huge revenue up to be yeah. achieved. But be realistic. I think... Uh, and have, oh, a, have a clear exam question. Have a clear exam question. And a clear and, expectation of benefits. And don't fall for the hype. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would say is it's very easy for people to um, walk in and promise the earth. Yeah. And particularly when you're in the middle of a hype cycle like we are at the moment, this stuff, someone says, just spend 10 million pounds with us and we will solve your business. Yeah. And I would say anyone who's coming in with a big bang proposition like that, whether they are Accenture, whether they are KPMG, whether they are, you know, Deloitte or Artifact or Landmark, that's not the way to win yeah. this game. Test some stuff, T test it for yourself, do things with your own data in your own systems to answer your own exam questions, yeah. and then you'll be in a position to build, because every business has its own unique yeah. strategies and, and needs. I completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. Alex, thank you very much. Chris, real pleasure. pleasure to see you again. Likewise. And good luck with Landmark. Thank you.